Hello and welcome to the second video in my Tracks Through Time series where I explore elements of transport and mobility history that fascinate me and I hope they interest you too. So today I'll be looking at a significant event in British Railway history, the Midland Railway's abolition of second class accommodation from the 1st of January 1875. And this is significant because from that point second class would steadily disappear. So. I'll look at how and why that railway made that decision. I will consider what were the reactions of the Midland Railway's competitors and what did the people think? What, what was this said about this change? And a lot of people were not happy and I'll unpack that a bit. So firstly, why did the Midland do this? In the 1860s and 1870s, the company was expanding. In 1869, it had built its line to London, to St Pancras. And in 1876, it would open the Cecil to Carlisle. So what this did was add another main line between London and Scotland, putting it in direct competition with the East and West Coast main lines. Now, the Midland could not actually meet the other two on speed, but it did offer a better service. It tried to tap a growing third class market Third class travel had been increase, increasing as a proportion of travel overall uh, since the earliest days of the railway. But in 1860, third class tickets constituted 57% of all tickets sold. By 1872, it constituted 74%. In the early 1870s, the company had actually attached third class accommodation to all trains to attract this growing segment of passengers. But in 1875, what it did was profound and uh, completely disrupted the norms of railway travel that had been established for decades. So it didn't just abolish second class. It made a very strong appeal to third class passengers by increasing the quality of third class accommodation, but not changing the price, which was roughly a penny a mile. It also appealed to the other two classes of passenger. Second class passengers could now go in first class because the price was reduced, whilst first class passengers actually just had a reduced cost of travel. This was considered at the time a masterstroke of strategy, and the individual responsible for that was the Midland Railway's general manager, James Allport. This is a significant change and the other railway companies are disturbed by it. It seems aggressive and the Midland says, oh, well, this isn't aggressive. Well, I think it was. The East and West Coast uh, railway companies had a meeting to talk this over and to, to come to a, a clear decision on, on the course of action that they could take. Eventually, other companies followed suit. And in the years and decades after, second class travel gradually disappeared. Some other people reaction to it was grounded in established understandings about the class system of Victorian Britain, which many people thought was rigid. So Edward Watkin, the chairman of numerous railway companies and on the board of others, said that this was a great public injustice driving together classes who do not wish to associate. But Watkins response was actually in tune with the response that many people had. The conservative leaning publication Punch printed in October 1874 a cartoon. This willfully misrepresented the Midlands changes and I'll read you the caption. Mate of familiars. What? No second class? No return tickets? I can't afford to go first and I won't go third. What am I to do? But of course, she would have been able to go first. The ticket price had come down. So what Punch is effectively saying there is this is going to throw people together who don't want to and shouldn't be travelling together. Lord Reddersdale, a Conservative MP, was particularly disturbed by the Midlands changes. He argued what was to stop them taking off first class? What was to stop them just using cattle trucks to convey people? Such was his anger or unhappiness that he actually introduced a bill into Parliament to impose three classes on the railway industry. It was called the Railway Trains Regulation Bill. In the debate, he said the following. The three classes were, quote, in strict accordance with the expectation 
and habits of the people and had been in use for many years to the great public convenience. He believed that first class passengers had more to complain of than either of the other two classes in respect to the change on the Midland. And that last sentence was quite telling in that he felt that the first class passengers wouldn't want to associate people who they thought were perhaps lower down the social order. The bill, in the end, failed miserably and never made it into law. I think generally people saw the Midland Railway's activity as a positive thing, a sort of social levelling exercise and a way to open up opportunity for people. The context is again important here. The 1860s had seen a considerable amount of discussion about the role of the railway in national life and should the railways be nationalised. This had been a topic of topic of discussion in the 1840s. William Galt in 1843 had uh, released a pamphlet called Railway Reform where he advocated nationalisation and in the 1844 Railway Regulation Act there there are clauses saying that any railways built after that point could be uh, nationalised after 21 years. But in the 1860s you get a, a, a degree of discussion about this that is, I think, you know, it's it's greater than it has been. So Galt republishes or redrafts his uh, p- pamphlet. Roland Hill, who set up Penny Post that allowed people to send uh, mail anywhere in the in the nation for a penny, he advocated nationalisation. Edwin Chadwick, the social reformer, a member of the Royal Commission that sent up the Poor Laws and a driver behind major reforms in urban sanitation and public health. He also advocated a change of system, although he wanted a sort of franchise system like we have today. An interesting proposal came from a G. W. Jones in 1869. He released a pamphlet calling for a universal penny railway. It was ambitious and underpinning it was the idea that there should be state ownership. The railway would be divided up into toll sections and people would pay, dependent on class, for a journey across a section alighting to pay a charge at the next section. The other thing I think is interesting in the context is this is a period where there is discussion over nationalisation of the telegraph and this happens towards the end of the decade and actually comes into effect in 1870. So there is another precedent for nationalisation of a uh, a networked industry. Also towards the end of the decade you get electoral reform and the franchise is widened which means that politicians are more subject, shall we say, to the interests of their constituents. So if they're unhappy with the railways, the politicians will likely listen more keenly. As such, all the things I've described, including the proposals for the nationalisation of the railways and networked industries, suggest that people very much perceive the railways as a public service that should act in the interest of the nation and the economy and the people. As such, when we get to the 1870s and the Midlands putting on of third class accommodation on all trains and then the abolition of second class and the improvement of travel standards, this is seen as a good act, as something that is beneficial to the people. And this view is spread and widely disseminated and people praised the railway. The Times said that it had improved the company's profitability and, quote, conferred inestimable benefit upon the poorer classes by conveying third-class passengers by all trains. One writer called the abolition of second class a philanthropic act. To conclude, I think the abolition of second class travel by the Midland in 1875 was a significant event in railway history, but also the reactions to it tell us something about how some people felt about the structure of society, but also how that they felt that the railways should be doing good and should be working in the national interest. So that's my show for this week. I hope you've enjoyed it. So tune in next time.